So today we are delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, Dermot Ferreter, and his talk is on the War of Independence in Ireland in 1920. Dermot Ferreter is one of Ireland's best known historians. He's a professor of modern Irish history at University College Dublin. His main research interest is the social, political and cultural history of 20th century Ireland. He has written a number of books, including the critically acclaimed biography, Judging Dev, an insight into one of Ireland's most influential leaders, Eamon de Valera. He also contributes widely on radio, television, and to the print media. Dermot, you're very welcome. Thank you all very much uh, for that warm welcome. It's, it's an absolute pleasure and honour to be here, albeit under very difficult circumstances. Uh, I want to thank the committee of the Balbriggan and District, District Historical Society in particular. I know that there has been Trojan work done to mark the importance of the terror that was wreaked on Balbriggan exactly 100 years ago in September 1920. Um, I know that justice has been done to so many different aspects of the history of that particular event and what it represented and the impact that it had on those who were affected at the time and of course subsequently. And I particularly want to acknowledge the relatives of those who were affected who are here uh, today. A reminder um, that this is a legacy which endures um, and there are people who still of course have a, a very strong personal connection to it um, who are with us today. Um, it's of course part of a much broader and wider commemoration uh, of the War of Independence period but it is um, of the utmost importance I think that there is that sense um, of, of local ownership of events that had such a a profound impact on communities and on civilians in particular and it's a reminder of course of one of the dominant themes of the War of Independence period uh, the impact that it had uh, on the civilians innocent civilians uh, who were so affected uh, by the various um, outrages and traumas and terrors of Ireland during the War of Independence period um, and we do need to be conscious of course of the many layers of the War of Independence experience in Ireland 100 years ago uh, I'm very conscious that there will be others today who will drill down into the details of precisely what happened in Balbriggan um, in September 1920. My task really is to provide a broader context for that occurrence in September 1920. What was the experience of the War of Independence in Ireland in 1920? How do we put the events in Balbriggan uh, in a broader context? Um, and we have to be aware that what happened in Balbriggan in September 1920 was the product of a multitude of different forces and currents and impulses um, in Ireland 100 years ago. And what I want to try and do this morning is to tease uh, some of them out. It has long been maintained that Ireland is a very interesting laboratory for the study of revolution because it's one of the best documented conflicts every, anywhere. Uh, we have an extraordinarily diverse archive uh, and range of documents in relation to the War of Independence period. And the more information that becomes available, the more that comes into the public domain, and that's a process that's never finished, the more we can appreciate that the War of Independence was not necessarily, necessarily the um, vindication of an astute master plan. Um, one of the historians of this period, Joost Augustine, uh, has made the point uh, that it's often about coincidence, unintended outcomes and local initiatives. And we do need to try and recover something of the texture of that. This is a point that Charles Townsend, the historian, would have made in his book, The Republic, uh, when he wrote about the need to try uh, and recover something of the experiences of the texture of that warlike experience and the various layers that are associated with it. If you consider the political layers, the psychological questions that arise, the intelligence war, the propaganda uh, battles uh, that were going on, uh, all of these are relevant to what happened in Balbriggan uh, in 1920, as of course is the whole question of violence and the trauma uh, 
uh, that we associate with that terror in Ireland 100 years ago. This was what the Catholic Archbishop of Cork, Daniel Cohelan, referred to as a devil's competition in Ireland in 1920. And what the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George referred to in a private family letter as the hell's broth that was Ireland. Though he neglected to point out, of course, that he had added many of the ingredients into that particular mixture. Fighting for the Republic in Ireland in 1920 was a messy business indeed. It's extraordinary to think that on paper there were 115,000 members of the Irish Republican Army. Uh, they would be the nominal role figures for IRA membership, um, as are reflected in the Irish military archives, for example. So on paper, this is an extraordinarily large uh, army. But that, of course, does not mean that there was an evenness of experience for the Republicans throughout the country. The vast majority of members of the IRA were not actively involved uh, in this war. Uh, only a fraction and a small fraction of them uh, are actively engaged in warfare. And there were many tensions over control of the IRA's campaign and of the Republican strategies. It's true that uh, for the IRA, it far exceeded uh, its limited resources in terms of its impact uh, on the enemy. But control of the strategy of the IRA was never straightforward. Many volunteers in the IRA never took an oath of allegiance, for example, to the Doyle. Local leadership could be highly uh, variable. Lines were frequently blurred uh, within the Republican movement. It's, it's true that towards the end of 1920, uh, the IRA brought more of a focus and a coherence uh, to its campaign and perhaps more of an effective strategy. But again, this was uneven throughout the country. The IRA was stronger in the Western half of the country. Uh, wealthier parts of the country were less likely to provide volunteers for the IRA. Uh, and broadly speaking, you could say that the IRA was composed of young Catholic men of limited social standing. That was the phrase that was used by the historian based in Cork, John Borgonovo, uh, about the typical profile uh, of an IRA member. But this class issue, of course, is not always clear-cut, and we do need to add that caveat. But broadly speaking, that was a, a fair description, young Catholic men of limited social standing. We also know that the IRA was very poorly armed nationally. It's estimated that the IRA only had access to in the region of 3,000 rifles uh, in Ireland in 1920. And as John Borgonovo also points out, most volunteers in the IRA never fired a gun. Most of them were engaged in different kind of work, in sabotage, in watching, in hiding, in destroying uh, infrastructure, in communicating uh, messages. And the same was true, of course, of members of Comanaman, the female auxiliary of the IRA. And it was an auxiliary force. It wasn't an armed force. That does not mean that there were not individual members uh, who were able to bear arms or did bear arms. But most of those involved in Common Aman are doing a different type of work, again, carrying uh, dispatches involved in first aid. Uh, but there were also members of Common Aman who were business owners uh, who were able to provide the IRA with a degree of cover. Uh, and Common Aman, again, depending on which part of the country uh, you were in, uh, had different impacts in different areas. How do we look now at some of the traditional narratives that came out uh, in the early decades after the War of Independence about the symbiotic relationship between the IRA and Common Aman and the Irish people? Well, again, historians would be more skeptical about some of the sweeping claims that were made in the 1930s and the 1940s about that symbiotic relationship between the IRA uh, and the people. We do know that there was a contest around the whole notion um, of Irishness, of Irish nationalism. 400 RIC barracks, for example, were burned down in April 1920 alone. Were all of the members of the Royal Irish Constabulary in those barracks, were they all to be considered enemies of Irish nationalism? In many respects, they were according to the diktats of the IRA, but many of those individuals did not see themselves uh, as anti-national, indeed quite the opposite. So we do have to be conscious, I suppose, of the battles in relation to identity, in relation to nationalism uh, in this year, 1920, uh, during the War of Independence.
We also know that the same Catholic Archbishop, or the Catholic Bishop of, of Cork, who I mentioned earlier on, Daniel Cohelan, uh, did issue a decree of excommunication at the very end of 1920, um, directed at those who were engaged uh, in warfare within the Republican movement. But isn't it revealing that it was greeted by silence by many of his colleagues? And that silence may, of course, be as revealing as the issuing of the decree itself. So you do get that sense, too, of there being a certain silence uh, around certain things that were happening uh, in Ireland in 1920. Sean T. O'Kelly, one of the Sinn Féiners of that period, was furious with the Catholic Bishop of Cork and referred to him in a private letter to Patrick Hagan, uh, the rector of the Irish College in Rome, as a cowardly slave and a traitor. But again, how did you define treachery in Ireland in 1920? What we saw in February 1920 was the first alleged, uh, or the first killing of an alleged civilian uh, spy, who was Harry Quin Quinlisk, who was killed in February 1920. And it's a reminder again of the degree of concern that existed within the Republican movement about betrayal, about the determination uh, to ensure um, that there was no possibility of the IRA being compromised by civilians who were hostile to the Republican movement. Most of the soldiers in the IRA were in their late teens or early 20s when they died or were killed, or when they died or, or killed. You've got to remember that this was overwhelmingly a revolution, a conflict of the young for both men and women. And those in the Crown forces in Ireland in 1920 were also very young. When you look back now on the original advertisements for the recruitment of the Black and Tans, you can perhaps allow yourself a wry smirk. These Black and Tans were offered 10 shillings daily. The contemporary advertisement suggested that if you have the physique, the good character, and especially if you are an ex-service man, service in Ireland might be for you. And they began to arrive in March 1920. Eventually, there were to be over 8,000 of them. The historian David Leeson has done much research into the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries in terms of their backgrounds and the profile of the individual recruits. They were not the dregs of the prison population or of the criminal class, as was maintained by Republican propaganda. They were mostly young, unmarried, Protestant working-class men. Those who had served in the First World War did not have a monopoly on brutality in Ireland in 1920. Black and tans who had not served in the First World War were just as likely to be brutal as those who had. Another historian, William Lowe, has looked very closely at a sample of 2,300 of these recruits. And he came up with the startling finding that 19% of that sample of 2,300 had an Irish background. We also need to be conscious of the impact of the auxiliaries, a very different force. All of these are there to augment, of course, the police effort in Ireland in 1920. But the auxiliaries were essentially an elite strike force, ex-officer class. Henry Tudor, who was the chief of police in Ireland in 1920, insisted that the auxiliaries would make Ireland an appropriate hell for those whose trade is agitation. They were very well paid, seven pounds a week, a significant sum in 1920. And again, have a think about the contemporary advertisements that sought to recruit the auxiliaries. What was required, according to the advertisements, was discretion, tact, and judgment. They were deemed to be the requirements for service in Ireland. And what about their creation and then their coordination? Who was in charge? Who was responsible for the activities of Crown forces in Ireland in 1920? Did they fall between the two stools of politics and the military? Political for administrative purposes. The army for operational reasons. Did Neville Macready, the commander of the British forces in Ireland, actually want to take responsibility uh, for what was being done by the Black and Tans on the auxiliaries in 1920? There was a lack of willingness to take responsibility. Macready was later to comment that many within the auxiliaries treated martial law areas as special game preserve for their amusement. The complete lack 
of discipline, the breakdown of any sense of effective control. And McCready also suggested they were likely to be attacked by people who were pretending to be on good terms with them. The difficulty from the Crown Forces perspective of trying to identify the enemy. This was not the kind of warfare that they were used to. They were not used to dealing with those who were going around in civilian garb or those who were attacking and retreating, those who knew the Irish terrain very well, unlike the Crown Forces. But there was no effective or unified security police or military command in Ireland in 1920 or indeed 1921. There was also an intelligence battle going on. And we can see this as a seesaw battle between the IRA and the British side. Both sides were able to inflict significant blows, but that alternated with considerable bouts of failure throughout 1920 and 1921. There's also a politics of the War of Independence that we need to factor in. What was the situation with regard to the politics of Irish republicanism at that stage? De Valera, in some respects, suffered from what the historian Ronan Fanning suggested was the hazard of adulation. De Valera, of course, is abroad for much of 1920 on his tour of the United States. He is the most famous Irish politician in the world. He is very well received in certain parts of America. There's a more hostile reception uh, in other parts. He doesn't ultimately succeed in getting official recognition of the Irish Republic at the very highest levels of American politics. But he does succeed in increasing the profile of the Irish question and in raising very, very considerable amounts of money in the region of five million pounds during that American trip, 18 months of an American trip. But the kind of attention that he was getting, the kind of fame that he was garnering, according to the Sinn Féin representative in the United States, Patrick McCartan, led to de Valera having an unconscious contempt for the opinions of others. And there were some eyebrows raised in Dublin politics about de Valera's take on the military strategy of 1920. De Valera and Mulcahy, for example, would have had different views on how the IRA should be carrying out its operations and indeed on the significance of Dublin as a crucible of conflict. De Valera was more towards the end of the year drawn to the idea of spectaculars, high profile events that would bring a lot of publicity as opposed to regular small scale engagements. There were other tensions within that Republican underground government. Cahill Brewer as Minister for Defence hated Michael Collins, for example. Collins, in turn, was scathing about the administrative, administrative limitations, as he saw it, of many of his ministers, including Austin Stack, the Minister for Home Affairs. We do need to think of Michael Collins as an organiser, as a desk-bound man rather than an active fighter, someone who was strategising, someone who had extraordinary personal contacts and energy, but perhaps did not have as much control as myth would suggest, particularly when it comes to outside of Dublin. And there were also silences, deliberate silences. The way historian Ronald Fanning put it in relation to Mulcahy and Michael Collins was that over many matters there was a constructive and Cistercian silence. Collins suggested in January 1920, that people who are very busy are never, never so busy that they cannot do extra. It was a reminder of his impatience, what he regarded as the limitations of his colleagues, the importance of getting the strategy right. De Valera had to remind him in a somewhat amusing letter that God did not give everyone the ordered mind he gave you, Michael, a very revealing comment about the way Collins operated. There was also then the question of how the Republican movement was attempting to supplant the British administration in Ireland. This is not just about clandestine Doyle or cabinet meetings. This is also about the operation of Sinn Féin control at local level and through local affairs and local government. In the late 1940s, W.T. Cosgrave, who was Minister for Local Government during uh, the War of Independence period, gave a statement to the Bureau of Military History 
And he emphasized the importance of the loss of civil control when it came to British government in Ireland. The importance of finance at local government level, getting the allegiance of the local authorities, of the county councils. And there was also the question of the Sinn Féin courts, which begin to operate in 1920. The Irish Times suggested in June 1920 that the whole countryside, countryside brings its rights and wrongs to the courts of Sinn Féin. Now that was something of an exaggeration, but the courts did have some success. They did demonstrate perhaps that Sinn Féin would be able to challenge the authority of British rule in Ireland, particularly when it came to the establishment of arbitration courts that were established at district and parish level by May of 1920. But the loss of British finance, particularly when it came to local government, given all of the areas that local government was responsible for, was to prove to be an enduring problem. And what about the British political perspective on Ireland during this period? Let's not forget the extent to which British policy towards Ireland was characterized mostly by disinterest, confusion, and a sense that they had much bigger other political priorities, particularly in the context of the maintenance of their empire. Many British politicians were convinced that the IRA in Ireland in 1920 was just another reincarnation of Irish criminality. The way historian Honor Fanning has put it, there was no such thing as a coalition Irish policy except the necessity not to have one. And this was an indication, of course, that the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was leading a coalition government. There were what have come to be known as hawks and doves when it came to the Irish question within that coalition government. But what was the situation in 1920? A Dublin castle, the centre of British rule in Ireland, that had 36 different departments. A Chief Secretary, Hamer Greenwood, who was sceptical about the policy of coercion. The Permanent Secretary to the Treasury, Warren Fisher, charged with the task of compiling a report on the administration of British government in Ireland from Dublin Castle. And he was scathing about the lack of quality of the political advice. The Castle administration does not administer, was his stark conclusion. And we do see a changing of the guard. The emergence of John Anderson as Undersecretary. People like Mark Sturgis the influential Andy Cope, some who believed that repression was not the solution to the Irish problem, some who were going to begin to look at exploring ways out or perhaps channels of communication. Could they establish some kind of links with the moderates or the responsible leaders in Sinn Féin as they were sometimes referred to? And they're often thinking of Arthur Griffith. But then there are conflicting impulses. The Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, which is implemented in August 1920, allowing for the arrest and the internment and the court-martial of civilians. David Lloyd George, refusing to acknowledge that there is a war going on in Ireland. The IRA he depicts as just a small murder gang. And of course, later in the year, he famously declares that the British had murder by the throat in Ireland when all of the evidence was pointing in the opposite direction. But in truth, the declaration of martial law was actually a diluted version of what many senior military figures wanted. There may have been those who privately believed that the status of the British Empire would be better served by getting out of Ireland. But the momentum was not with that particular perspective for much of 1920. True, Winston Churchill, as Secretary of State for War, was to acknowledge privately the failure of force. But he was also sending very different signals privately and publicly throughout 1920. True, David Lloyd George had insisted at one stage, I feel certain you must hang in relation to responding to Republican violence. But he was able to acknowledge privately by the end of the year that sooner or later we will have to talk to the people that matter. But enacting something, some measure, that would solve the Ulster question was the first priority. And that's the point about the end of 1920. 
Before you can deal with the Irish Republican problem from the British perspective, you have to try and deal with the Ulster question. And that is one of the reasons why we have the emergence of the Government of Ireland Bill that partitioned this country in December 1920. As a result of the proceedings of the committee overseen by Walter Long, a unionist at the heart of British government. The whole idea of Ulster exclusion, the creation of a new six-county state, the creation on paper of two different dominions in Ireland, though of course the Republicans rejected uh, that solution emphatically. What was the advantage from a British government perspective of partitioning Ireland through this measure? Well, Philip Kerr, one of the advisors to the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, summed it up like this. It would take Ulster out of the Irish question and it would take Ireland out of English party controversies. Let's try and get it off the table. But it had profound consequences. In the summer of 1920, we had the expulsion of so many workers from the Harland and Wolf shipyards in Belfast, for example. Those expulsions were a catalyst for a violence that began and would ultimately claim the lives of in the region of 500 people over the next two years. There was also considerable violence after the killing of Gerald Smith, who was the Commissioner for Police in, London, in Munster. His funeral in Down is regarded as an event that unleashed hell in Ulster at that stage. There was also the creation of a new Ulster constabulary, financed by the British government, of whom the most notorious became the B Specials. And there is, of course, the beginnings of a series of minority problems in Ireland as a result of this partition of Ireland. Not just the obvious one in, th in terms of one third of the population uh, of Northern Ireland who consider themselves to be anything uh, other uh, than members of this new Orange community, but also in the region of 70,000 Protestants in Donegal and Cavan and Monaghan who found themselves on what they considered to be the wrong side of the border. The fear of abandonment uh, that existed on both sides of that new border into 1921 is something that is palpable and problematic. And there are other battles that are being fought throughout this year 1920. How do you control the narrative of what is happening in Ireland? How do you influence public opinion? The battles over propaganda were essential. At the very beginning of 1920, David Lloyd George as Prime Minister had declared that any attempt at secession from the Empire by Irish Republicans would be fought with the same determination as the North had put into the South uh, in dealing with the American Civil War. And he said it is important that this is known throughout the world. He was tailoring his message, of course, for those in America who were sympathetic to the Irish Republican cause, to try and characterize those who were active in support of Ireland in the United States as less than loyal to the United States. But David Lloyd George had also met his match when you consider the journey of Eamon de Valera across the United States. And that journey was only one manifestation of Sinn Féin's considerable success when it came to the propaganda battle. Sinn Féin had envoys, envoys internationally in places as far away as Chile and Argentina, in Barcelona. It had the Irish Bulletin, a Sinn Féin publication that gave its take on the War of Independence and was sent to newspapers around the world. Michael Collins wrote a very revealing letter to George Gavin Duffy in 1920 when he suggested that real progress is to be estimated much more by what is thought abroad than by what is thought at home. And Neville McCready was able to acknowledge in private that this propaganda business is the best weapon that Sinn Féin has. In many respects, he was correct. Basil Clark was appointed by the British government to begin the British counter-propaganda effort or officially to suppress or neutralize the plethora of adverse news reports that were coming out of Ireland. And that's where an event like the sack of Balbriggan was very relevant. How is that news communicated internationally? What images are going around the world of what is happening in Ireland? And do they contradict the assertion that there is no war going on in Ireland? 
Do they contradict the assertion that the Irish problem is being contained in 1920? There were attempts to link Sinn Féin with the so-called Red Menace, to depict them as communist gunmen. Sinn Féin, of course, counteracted British propaganda by suggesting that if Britain had fought the First World War for the rights of small nations, it seems to be working towards the very opposite in Ireland. There was also an American Commission on Conditions in Ireland. This was formed at the very end of 1920 and was later to record 48,474 army raids on Irish homes in the year 1920. There were also photos, particularly those taken by W.D. Hogan in Dublin, who was given a ringside seat at many of the events of that year with the sanction of Sinn Féin. And again, those images were to be very powerful in terms of the propaganda battle. Sinn Féin indeed had a fully-fledged department of propaganda. The Restoration of, Ireland, uh, Restoration of Order in Ireland Act of August 1920, which I mentioned a few moments ago, also had profound consequences for media, for censorship, for control of newspapers. It's estimated that 26 newspapers were put out of circulation in Ireland in 1920 alone. But journalists were still determined to visit Ireland. They were determined to resist the kind of censorship that had existed during the First World War. Consider, for example, the efforts of Hugh Martin of the Daily News, who was filing reports on Ireland based on what he had seen, based on first-hand experience that again were contradicting many of the British public, political and military assertions. The role of journalism, of newspapers, of media coverage was also crucial to one of the most dramatic and high-profile events of 1920, which was the hunger strike of Terence McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork, in Brixton Prison. He eventually died after 74 days on hunger strike. There was fascination with this. How could somebody endure a 74-day hunger strike? There was very little awareness in 1920 about how long somebody could last on hunger strike. McSweeney himself had suggested at its commencement, I shall be free alive or dead within a month. But of course, he lasted much longer. And he was aware of the potential power of this harrowing, harrowing hunger strike. He wrote to Cahill Brewer in September, If I die, I know the fruit of my death will exceed the cost a thousandfold. He was well aware of the power that he had. There's also then the question of it being, in the words of David Hannigan, a very modern media moment. The international interest, the constant waiting for updates, for news, which keeps this story going over so many weeks. And Terence McSweeney inspired many beyond Ireland, there's no doubt about that. Consider the mobilization in New York, for example, of the United Negro Movement Improvement Association, marching in support of Terence McSweeney or 40,000 marchers in Manchester, support in India. And when eventually the inevitable death came, there was the funeral. Rosamund Jacob, a suffragist and Republican activist of that period, wrote to Hannah Sheehy Skeffington suggesting such events as that funeral were a kind of emotional orgy. And what she was trying to encapsulate was the heightened emotions that were generated as a result of the events of 1920. And we cannot discount emotion in how we approach the history of this period 100 years on. It was a profound influence. Britain also lost the propaganda war due to reprisals. Michael Hopkinson one of the great historians of the War of Independence has suggested that the black and tans were effect rather than cause, in the sense that they were a product of the policies of the British government, of the policies of David Lloyd George. The black and tans was a dismal record and it reflected very poorly on their political creators. 
Consider what the Observer newspaper had to say in September 1920, the month of the sacking of Balbriggan. The Observer maintained there had been an immense weakening of Britain's moral position in the world. Even within the Royal Irish Constabulary, there was huge resentment at the Black and Tans on the Auxiliaries because many in the RIC regarded them as different, as men of low moral character. And that was a phrase that was used in relation to the RIC mutiny in the stole led by Jeremiah Lee in 1920. The RIC in Tipperary and Cork also, however, resorted to its own so-called murder gang tactics in carrying out targeted killings anonymously as the conflict progressed. Consider the events that we associate not just with Balbriggan, but with Cork, with Mallow. Think about the policy of reprisals. Think about the IRA's strategy in relation to those reprisals. Winston Churchill was completely contemptuous about the IRA strategy. The way Neville McCready put it was that many of those in the Crown forces had no other redress open to them other than reprisals. There are memoirs of some of the Crown forces who served in Ireland in the Imperial War Museum in London. One of them was Major General Douglas Wimberley. And he referred to the fact, tied as we always were by restrictions on our legal actions, meant that there had to be an outlet for frustration. McCready also suggested that troops without the spirit to retaliate were not worth a damn. But McCready and others were also aware that one of the favoured military strategies for Ireland was simply not politically acceptable. Those who wanted to sweep across Ireland with a full militarised offensive, the so-called policy of Cromwell, the Cromwellian severity that some believed was the only way to stamp out the IRA's campaign. In September 1920, after Winston Churchill and Henry Tudor, the Chief of Police, had met with Henry Wilson, who was Chief of the Imperial General Staff of the British Army, Wilson recorded his account of the conversation. What had been made clear during the conversation was that the police and the Black and Tans and the estimated 100 intelligence officers in Ireland at that time are all carrying out reprisal murders. Wilson said, I'm glad I am in no way responsible. I have protested for months against this method of trying to out-terrorise the terrorists. And again, he was of the view that what was needed was this militarised offensive that was not acceptable for political reasons. Because there were those in British politics who still prided themselves on the idea that they were an enlightened liberal power. The reprisals and the events of the autumn and winter of 1920 also appalled the Archbishop of Canterbury, Randall Davison. Privately in May 1920, he wrote that Ireland was the worst sore in our body politic. And publicly in November, he was moved to make a public attack on Britain's policies in Ireland in the House of Lords. And what was equally revealing was that he was surprised at the amount of support he received for his stance at that time. Central to all of these developments is the question of the nature of killing, the nature of trauma. One of the events or one of the experiences that historians are going to be devoting a lot of attention to, I think, uh, in the years to come, partly as a result of the amount of archival material we have in relation uh, to the long-term consequences of the nature of this killing. What Yeats, the poet famously referred to as half-drunk or whole mad soldiery, had, of course, profound consequences. Consider the experiences of Sean Gibbons, of Seamus Lawless. Have a look at the official language that was used. Killed by being stabbed with sharp instruments by unknown men of the police forces of the Crown. What did that actually mean in practice? Butchery. What did it mean for those 
who were left behind. What about the experiences too of Eileen Quinn, who was shot dead, pregnant, in Gort in 1920? A mother expectant who was mortally wounded was the official finding. A military court decided that it was death by misadventure. It was, of course, nothing of the sort. And what about the experiences of Patrick and Harry Lochnane in Galway? Their hands tied together, tethered to a lorry, dragged through the roads, then executed. Of Harry, nothing remained of his face except his chin and lips, and his skull was entirely blown away. And what about the other hidden deaths? The death of Bessie Carberry, who was strangled in a Dublin alleyway with no soldiers prosecuted. Or those young women who had their hair shaved, who were tarred and feathered for their perceived wrongdoing. In June in 1920, in Tralee, for example, 20 men forcibly, forcibly dragged two girls from a house and went at them with shears and tar. What was the experience for the younger people who were traumatized during that period? On both sides. Perhaps the most famous individual of tender years in Ireland in 1920 was Kevin Barry, the UCD medical student, the mere boy of 18 summers, who was hanged in November, the first such execution since the 1916 Rising. One of his contemporaries, a fellow student, Celia Shaw, kept a diary in which she recorded the surging fury that was experienced by the student population as a result. The Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, William Walsh, pleaded with John Anderson, the Undersecretary, to reprieve Kevin Barry to which the response was, if Kevin Barry was reprieved, this would be a public declaration of the helplessness of the law in Ireland in 1920. And what about the soldiers who were involved in the ambush that Kevin Barry was executed as a result of? Marshal Whitehead, whose bowel was perforated in three places, killed as an only son from Halifax, just 20 years of age. What about the nature of these killings, including those on Bloody Sunday morning? What Anne Dolan has referred to as a new, intimate kind of killing. But historians are also trying to underline the shreds of humanity that we still need to think about. Not in the sense that any of these were humane killings, the humanity in the sense of trying to get inside the head of those who were pulling the triggers or on the receiving end of the bullets. Were they scared? Were they nervous? Were they accurate? Were they traumatized? How long did they carry that with them? So that is something that has to be considered in relation to many of these terrifying events of late 1920. There is a sense, of course, with the sacking of Balbriggan, or with bloody sunding, or indeed with the burning of Cork, that these become national events, that there are national narratives about them. But as Michael Foley, who has written so well about Bloody Sunday, has pointed out, we have to make sure that the truth of the individual stories does not fall between the cracks when it comes to these national high-profile events. And there was also the nature of war. What happened in Balbriggan? What happened in Cork? An auxiliary, Charlie Schultz, who was involved observing the burning of Cork, wrote to his girlfriend at the time, referring to it as an act of sweet revenge, and that men who had witnessed it had not seen anything like it since Flanders during the First World War. So there are all of these different layers to the experience of the War of Independence in 1920. Many in Ireland, of course, are not involved at all. Many are trying to get on with their lives. They're on the getting on with life side of the Irish question in 1920. But there was inevitably a profound impact on civilians. How revealing is it 
that when it came to the sacking of Balbrigging, for example, that those who experienced personal injury and death were not compensated as well as those who had suffered commercially. Consider also those who were fighting battles for material survival uh, in 1920. The county council workers, for example, some of whom were being paid 16 shillings, 9 pence for a 72-hour week when it came to local authority work in roads or housing. Or those bakers in Drogheda, or farm labourers in Cork who were striking for better pay and better conditions. And what about those who were desperate for land? The Irish land war was not over in 1920. An estimated one-third of the farmers in the west of Ireland in 1920 were occupying holdings that were too small to make a living. Sinn Féin, in principle, of course, is in favour of land redistribution. It even establishes a land settlement court. But trying to deliver on that promise in the conditions of 1920 proves to be a tall order indeed. The historian Fergal Campbell has made the point that in many respects a rebel's conception of freedom in the west of Ireland in 1920 was economic as well as political. There were two struggles against the British state. There was, in many respects, a landlord class that was viewed as one and the same. There's much status resentment. Kevin O'Sheill, who was involved in arbitrating land disputes in the spring of 1920, referred to that period as the last land war in Ireland. It spread to 16 counties. There were numerous agrarian outrages. There were more agrarian outrages than any year since 1882. But there were limitations to arbitration, to solving those particular disputes. And there were always going to be those who would use this war of independence as an umbrella under which they could shelter in order to try and settle very different concerns. And in urban areas there was the experience of curfews, of rigorous raiding, of destruction of property, of a Dublin Metropolitan Police that no longer controlled the streets of Dublin. So I hope we can get some sense through all of this of the multitude of layers associated with Ireland in 1920 during that period of the War of Independence. How we remember, how we commemorate can often be deeply personal, it can be partial, it can perhaps involve a degree of compartmentalization, but we do have to try and untangle the knotty legacies and the emotions that these events still generate. We certainly don't need to dismiss those emotions. 100 years on, we have to, of course, look at all of the evidence that we have, while accepting that there is no definitive, fixed, or singular history of Ireland in 1920. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to this morning. <laughs>